This is part of a Convergence Lab uh, conversation, a space for critical discourse. And for this event, we're going to be focusing on your network. Uh, title of this talk is Your Network is Your Net Worth. My name is Michael Riley. I'm a black male. I was going to say vintage. Let's just say senior black male. I've got a blue base, baseball cap on and a blue uh, sweater. In the background is a collection of books and artifacts that reflects the madness that's going on inside my head at the moment. I'm an academic. Um, my work title is director of the Black Music Research Unit at the University of Westminster. Um, this is a space where we're pioneering, I would say, uh, research into what is black music in Britain? How long has it been, it been here? What is its contribution to culture, society, history, and so forth? And can you make money out of it? Who's made money out of it? Who's had a career? Who hasn't had a career? Um, what is a career? All of that is what my work now involves. Uh, I'm a senior lecturer, and as part of that, I work with young people who are looking to forge a career within the space of music. Now, a big part of this is networking, which is the focus of uh, this conversation. My colleagues on the panel is um, Marley, Larrington Nelson, AKA shy one. I don't think she's really that shy. Um, we'll find out why, how and why she's arrived at that title. Um, she's a DJ, but she'll tell you more about this. And Makeda um, Bennett, Upper Beng, hopefully I've pronounced that right. Who's one of the co-founders of SDS. Um, and again, she will explain uh, what that title refers to. It's her company. Um, I have met and worked with both of these individuals, but all will be revealed later on in the conversation. But before I move on, um, I think let's have an introduction from, let's start with uh, Marley. Would you just like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Michael. I'll give a, a brief introduction. Um, my name is Marley Larrington Nelson, also known as Shy One. Uh, I'm a black woman, currently got my long locks tied back and I'm wearing a black fleece. Behind me is a rack of a huge collection of National Geographic uh, magazines <laughs> and a lamp. <laughs> um, so I am a DJ, producer, um, sound artist and aspiring musician, I'd say, as I'm currently learning to play the piano again. Um, also part of the Touching Bass Collectives and was one of the kind of founding, was then the original build of the Black Obsidian Sound System um, and used to be a member of BBZ, uh, the Black Queer Art and DJ Collective. Okay, that's really interesting. Let's go to our other panellist, Makeda. Thank you, Just a Michael. brief introduction as to who you are and what you do. So um, my name is Makeda bennett Dampering. I am a young black female. I currently have on a, I would call it a 90s style bandana <laughs> with a grey t-shirt or grey hoodie. Um, my background is currently blurred because it's full of boxes. Um, I'm the project officer at British Underground and the founder of SDS Entertainment, standing for Setting the Standards. Um, I'm also a graduate from the University of Westminster. Um, the focus of today's talk is networking, but it's also the ability to build and monetize your network within the creative arts. This is a complicated um, social skill, we could call it, but it's also a business skill. And we all uh, are engaged in networking at one level or another. We all 
um, participate in creating relationships and exploiting these relationships. However, within the creative community, this is quite complex. The point at which one decides, actually makes a conscious decision to interface um, creatively with another individual happens quite naturally. However, monetizing that relationship is fraught with any number of obstacles, not least the money itself. So over the next uh, period of discussing this with my fellow panelists, we'll look at it in terms of our various projects, how we've engaged with these projects, how we've arrived at the idea, let's start there, then move the idea into a public space and then targeted consciously or subconsciously other creatives to make that idea real. And then at some point, the question of how do we monetize that collection of individuals, that list of contacts, um, because all projects need funding. And this is perhaps one of the most challenging areas. So um, as part of that, I think I'll start off with one of my projects. Um, and I'll start off, where shall I start off? I'll start off by sharing my screen. Hopefully um, you can see what I can see in just one second. Um, and I'll be sharing um, my first screen, which is my website. So fellow panelists, can you see that? Yes. Can, Great. Yes. That means everyone else can. Um, I initially introduced myself as director of the Black Music Research Unit. Well, this is our website, and it's the website of a, the first major research project uh, in the UK looking at the impact and legacy of reggae. We had to start somewhere. But if we, I just go back a bit, in order to develop even the website, I had to develop the research centre. And this meant finding people initially that I guess just agreed with me. But even before that, I had to explain to myself what the project is, um, who might be interested, and the relevance of the project. And as straightforward as that might seem, it's not. You can't move forward without having other people involved. And creatively, it's very difficult um, sometimes to explain what you have in mind without having already created that thing uh, and have that thing explain itself, if that makes sense. In this instance, um, the website is a space where I would host everything that I created within the project. And I should just take a small step back. My journey to this point is that I'm a musician, an artist, a performer uh, who became a manager and a promoter within the music business. And so I've repeatedly moved a thought process into um, a public space. So it's an idea, convert the idea into something physical, um, market that physical thing to others. And as the focus here is networking, normally you turn to friends first, um, people you know. In this instance, um, I'm moving outside of my comfort zone with this project. I have to find people that are digital experts that work within the digital domain. And I wanted them to build a website that looked very expensive so that I could go after money uh, and money kind of finds more money. Um, if you look cheap, it's very, let's just say it's more difficult to get someone to invest in you. And so the website, building of the website meant finding quite a few people uh, to make it happen. This involved photographers, um, website builders, um, video uh, uh, producers, um, collections of images, um, 
and people that generally understood what it was I was trying to do, but initially would not charge me. And this is the important bit, initially would not charge me, but invest in the idea. So I just want to plant that. One of the first steps in networking is finding people that have sufficient faith in you to invest in your idea. They're not going to charge you up front, but they have sufficient belief that your idea will become something valuable, that they will invest in you. So that's a first step. Now, within the site, um, I wanted to move to a key project within the site, which is the Grime Report, and hopefully the, the link works um, here. The Grime Report um, in 2017-18 became the first report, big data report. And with this report, I challenged the London Metropolitan Police, who were disproportionately um, targeting young black males in, in grime, into grime music, performing as grime artists, um, and would prevent them from performing as a short story. But the idea was to create a report that would showcase what was really happening within this community. Um, and to represent the grime community as um, a collection of entrepreneurs, which they are as um, the cutting edge of uh, creativity, which they are, as business individuals, which they are, as leading creatives within the music industry, which they are. And in order to do that, I had to get Ticketmaster on board. I had to network my way into a major organization. Um, and the challenge was, who do you know? And in London, they say that within the creative industry, where perhaps two degrees of separation, and, and just to explain what that means without going into a lecture, it means that you're only, if you speak to the right two people, the right two individuals, you're actually connected to anyone at the top or the bottom of the music industry, just the right two people, which then means it's about how do you connect with these people? How do you network into these, uh, to find these individuals? That was my challenge. Um, and in order to find the right two people, I had to network through a lot of individuals. But essentially, I did that. And the key person on this list is a lady here called Tina Marie, um, who's the editor, became the editor of the Grime Report, but was also um, one of the technology experts and researchers um, for Ticketmaster, who are owned by Live Nation. And the short story here is that we were able Having made that one connection to that person, that person is connected to the largest promoter in the UK, Live Nation. I was then able to connect with all the key artists within Grime. Um, we'll come back to the details of the report um, later. But the report, in a nutshell, challenged the Metropolitan Police. Um, we had hard data evidence as to um, the history and impact of black music in London. We had hard evidence again, because uh, Ticketmaster is a big data company. We had hard evidence as to the contributions, historical contributions made through sales of tickets, but also they were able to predict who was going to be most successful in grime, who was going to be performing at Glastonbury. And with all this information, they were also able to show the trends in grime, who the audience was, just through one connection. Um, and one person who believed in the report, I was able to connect all the dots and deliver a powerful piece of information that we could then challenge 
the London Metropolitan Police with. Um, whilst I'm here, this report is still online, so you can uh, access it via the um, Black Music Research Unit website. And all the data is there. Um, Makeda is a crucial networking cog in this, and she can explain her role. But the point I'm making here is one person, one connection, one correct connection made it possible to deliver this uh, report. Without that person, we would have delivered a report, but it would not have been this report. So I'll just leave that for the moment and come back to you. Um, the point I'm making here is that the importance of making new relationships and understanding how these relationships result in an outcome. What I haven't said is how I made that connection. So I'll just end this first bit of the chat with, I probably networked through 50 different individuals to make that one connection, but I was very focused on the fact that I needed someone connected to data, connected to a large institution, a large organization like Live Nation. Um, and I worked my way backwards through all of those people or forwards through all of those people until I found Tina who worked at Ticketmaster. I then had to move that conversation into the idea of the report and convince this person that it made sense. And to do that, I had to create all the evidence um, I had to hand, and that's challenging. But I'm just trying to share a process and the amount of work involved in making one targeted connection um, to deliver an output. And it increased my network by about net, net worth by about 50 people. But the point here is it increased my net worth exponentially. That one report means I'm more valuable to the creative industries. Um, with that, I'm going to move on. We'll come back to this because it's a conversation. Um, and I'll just see if there's any questions from my esteemed uh, panel. Um, and then we'll move on to another short presentation. No questions? Okay. I'm sorry, I don't have one. Uh... Oh, that's Not pick right on now. You then. Not right now. <laughs> um, keeping this very democratic, who'd like to present uh, another short networking uh, example? I could, I could go because I can kind of piggyback off of um, Form 696 and the, the network um, within that whole model. Um, because for me, as Michael mentioned, my involvement with Form 696 was it was behind the scenes of, let's say, um, the Grime report, even though I was kind of involved with the, with the Grime report, but I was kind of more behind the scenes. So for me, how I managed to, to build up my network in order to scrap the form. So a key thing for, for me was as soon as I found out about Form 696, um, I realized that it was just something that had to be scrapped. And I was just, I just finished university and I was trying to figure out, I was in a job called British Underground and we did a lot of international showcasing um, events. And you know, I came across Form 696 and I thought, how do I get rid of this form? Who do I need to talk to? How do I, how do I kind of start my career off here, um, you know, doing, doing something so, so vital? So for me, from having a conversation with the boss, at, um, Crispin Parry at British Underground, and from us just having small conversations with people who we knew from the Musicians Union, because our office was inside their building, and then you'd have another conversation then um, with the Department of Culture, Media and Sport. We met somebody really key there called Jonathan um, Badiel, and he was he was really really into grind. So obviously, when he heard about Form Six Nine Six and how you know we wanted to get rid of it. He was the main connect for us to help us, you know, get to the culture minister at the time, to then get to the mayor of London, to get to the Metropolitan, Metropolitan Police, sorry, um, and so on and so forth. So for me, my network kind of expanded simply from having the idea, not even having the idea, but having the concept that this form is really bad and it does does nothing but negative, negative things for my community. Who can I speak to in order to get 
my thoughts and queries up to the top for us then have that main conversation. Um, so one thing that I'll, I can actually share with you um, in a second is just a few headlines from, um, you know, we managed to get the conversation about Form 696, it, Form 696 in um, like BBC, um, BBC News mentioned it, we had um, Noisy mentioned it, Vice mentioned it, and it was a conversation and it was a conversation and a network of people that all had a, a, a common goal, which was to get rid of the form. But I think having the form scrapped wouldn't have happened without having to have the initial small conversations with at least two or three key people, just in order for us to get it from an underground conversation to a top level uh, government, let's say, conversation. I, I think that's really important. I, th I should have mentioned Jonathan because um, through your connection and that meeting with Jonathan, mm. that then gave us access to um, a political advisor to a government minister. And so within, actually it's two people, it's actually two people. So Makeda to um, Jonathan, Jonathan to Matt Hancock. Matt Hancock, yeah. Um, we're into government. And what that led to, it meant that our project was now being discussed by government minister and at one point discussed and we were invited to mm. the House of Commons. Yeah. And we're not into five people yet, is, is the reality of it. Mm. Um, and within that journey, we're moving from, we've moved from an idea into a project that's been discussed in the House of Commons at, with the potential of challenging the um, London Metropolitan Police and changing actual policing policy in London. Yeah. Uh, do you wanna just finish off that? Uh, so what happened? Yeah. So what happened, what happened once we've managed to get uh, the story, let's say, or the questions and queries to the top. Um, Matt Hancock, at the time the culture minister, he sent a letter to the mayor of London um, to review Form 696. Um, within that time, that's when the Metropolitan Police then also, obviously you've got to look at the, the government policy kind of kind of side to the world. The Metropolitan, Metropolitan Police then um, became involved and we had a couple of conversations with them. Um, the mayor of London then obviously um, reviewed Form 696 and within a couple, uh, I'll say within the space of two months, maybe even three months, maybe a little bit less, it was then announced that the, the, form, the form was scrapped. And the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, then mentioned to everybody, you know, the form is scrapped. There's, there was actually no need for it. Um, the data that it was collecting was, was, was not important. It didn't help the community or anything like that. And I think the one thing that I think they would all agree with me upon is that the form, how I see it, is, would still exist if it wasn't for just one or two voices just saying, you do realise what this form is doing? Because at that time, the Metropolitan Police, at least, were not looking into the form and saying, oh, we need to scrap it, we need to review it and things like that. So I think it's just the level of having, like Michael said before, kind of having an idea and having the people to support your idea and then figuring out the, the steps to kind of get it to the people that will speak about it and make the change because sometimes for me I was just coming out of university so taking on a taking on like a responsibility that like scrap and form 696 I was thinking I don't know how we're going to do this I don't know who I need to speak to but with the network that I have let me just speak to a couple of people and see you know who can speak to who and who can speak to who because in the industry the industry is small and everybody kind of knows each other mm -hmm. so yeah for, for me it was just you know, speaking to the right people in the in the hope that it just gets higher and higher and higher to the people who can make change. And that is exactly what happened. And you can see that in the, the headlines here, just grabbed a few, um, you know, that like UK Music was involved as well. Um, they had the announcement, see uh, BBC News there, and, you know, just kind of across the board that everybody then cheered on and supported the fact that, you know, the form had been scrapped and that the conversation had managed to get its way all the way up to the top again. Yeah. yeah, hang on. Um, I think uh, maybe at this point we introduce or we just jump on 
shy one. <laughs> <laughs> just get you involved. Yeah. Um, do you want to just um, uh, refresh our memories of to who you are, what you do, and just tell us a bit about one of uh, the projects you've been involved with and perhaps a networking experience at the heart of that? Definitely. So uh, just to reintroduce, um, my real name is Marley Larrington Nelson and my artist name is Shy One. Um, I've been DJing and producing since I was 13, so I don't know, since 2003. Um, and I'm mentioning like when I started doing this because it will come back uh, around into when I talk about networking and some projects. Um, but to give a little history, uh, and also piggyback off of the grime the 696 uh, form topic. I originally come from the grime scene. That's the first scene that I started collecting records, um, listening to pirate radio, um, taping off of the radio, and then eventually, as well as mixing at that stage, then a year afterwards, making grime beats. Um, at the time, no intention of making money or no real, no expectation to make it. Um, to make any money from it. It was just a hobby and a passion. And um, in 2004, like I'd say, which is the gold, no, golden era, I don't know. That's the start of the talking. But um, definitely when, one of the early years of Grime, like in the first few years, um, a there was a, a really popular, suppose it was a networking <laughs> now I think about it it's a networking application called MSN messenger and that was how that was really popular with kids my age at the time with teenagers um not for consciously networking but just mostly for chatting to your friends you could have a display, a display status um people could see what you're playing and most importantly for us was you could share files and uh, my first music was shared like my first my early beats were shared on msn um to other mcs to friends and this was before i knew about or even wanted to have any like uh control over the distribution of my music it was the opposite like especially in the grime scene i think it was about just spreading your instrumentals especially for those of us who weren't established uh weren't pressing our records up weren't getting our stuff played on radio um, it was about sending it through MSN and it would get sent on to whoever else, as well as sending music through Bluetooth or even infrared. If you held your phone, I think, close enough, you could send things like that. Um, and so that's kind of where I started musically, just a hobby, just a very obsessed child. Um, I found my thing and I made a lot of online friendships. It was the norm, I think, at that age to have a lot of people that you were friends with who you had never actually met. You may not even know what some of them look like, which probably terrifies Michael and other parents <laughs> listening now. <laughs> you want to go and have a chat with your kids. Like, but you know what they sounded like? Well, maybe. No, there's some... To this day, there is one music producer by the name of Strategy, and I still... I even played one of his tunes in a boiler room a few years back. Um, and I've never, I've maybe seen a picture of him once as a school kid. I don't, I don't know what he sounds like. I don't, I could walk past him on the street. I have no idea, but we used to chat every day after school, send each other music. He actually introduced me to dubstep and I've never met. Yeah. Um, so, so just to clarify, yeah. maybe it's an age thing. <laughs> so you're chatting in other words, texting. Oh no, was this text? This Love wasn't text. This was on the, well, on the computer, dial up, you know, and this is this is on the desktop computer in the living room. Just sitting there, my mum's on the sofa, you know, watching telly and I'm just chatting away to strangers online. She has no idea. <laughs> Obviously, you play it down. But the reality of it is that you're chatting to strangers on the internet. But this was also like, there there were a few degrees of separation. This This guy went to the same school as some friends I actually had in West London. So, you know, I knew it wasn't some old man in Hull somewhere pretending <laughs> to be a teenage boy to chat to me. If a Hull might take offence. <laughs> <laughs> that came to mind and I don't know why. <laughs> um, and around this time, uh, in fact, it's worth mentioning, like the person who kind of put me on, the reason I'm even sat here today, the first person to release my music and play it on radio, which was Pirate at the time and then licensed, Rinse FM, is a guy called Scratch a DVA. And his 
my music came to his attention because a beat that was just sent on MSN with no intention of anything happening to it other than maybe hopefully some MCs vocaling it, anyone. Um, an MC did end up taking it to his studio, a guy by the name of Quam, and Scratch a DVA uh, inquired like whose tune was this, wanted to hear more of it, and then we established a relationship on MSN and, and began sending stuff, um, and eventually he released my first project. But Quam, um, so so that actual that unintentional networking actually resulted in in you know my career now and me releasing music. Um, and playing out and such. Um, and so the MC who uh, took the the instrumental to the studio and established that relation unintentionally, you know, kind of introduced me to um, this other artist and DJ who had a much bigger platform. Um, Kwame and I made a bunch of tunes, never meeting each other, only knew one picture to his face. I was actually anonymous at the time. Also, I just realised I'd never used to show my face. Um, <laughs> So I forgot that I was, I was the creepy. <laughs> Completely forgot that I was actually the one who wasn't showing my face. I used to obscure it with a cartoon, um, yeah, with a cartoon head. Um, but anyway, Kwame and I made some tunes back then, and then lost contact. I even stopped making music in that time. I went to university. I studied IT. Um, I took a year and a half out of music. I then released with Scratcher, my first ever, he kind of brought me back into music. This, you know, that that guy, I eventually met him um, in person and he kind of took me out of my little hiatus slash retirement and released my first EP in 2011. And then about two years later, uh, I was in a kebab shop in um, Old Street. I was staying at my dad's at the time and he lives in Old Street and I recognized the guy at the counter as being Kwam, the MC, who I hadn't spoken to for these years and the first person, you know, who I'd made some tunes with without meeting. And Kwam um, and I, you know, then we actually had a, a real life friendship there. We were both on a radio station, one road down as well in Old yeah. Street at the time called Radar Radio. And um, we met up in a pub and decided, let's make a project. It's been long enough. Let's actually make a project together. Um, and so, we eventually did like make this project that went on to it was a digital release with a with a physical print um but uh, a record label wanted to release it and we were able to make a little bit of income from it and i suppose i'm i'm i'm, tr I'm giving an example of how none of that was was intentional none of it was conscious but just me sending songs out randomly on msn and clicking it accept on an ad or, or adding this person once i had their contact resulted in and the time frame michael was um so from 2004 up until the ep that kwam and i released the joint project came out in 2018 i think um so how long is that well like 14 years or something it took it didn't take that long but that's this um like unconscious networking resulted in a release that also um like you know got us some some money we made money from it um it elevated our status a bit you know press was written about it um and yeah i suppose it opened some new doors for us and also introduced introduced us to other networks but here's here's the question um hopefully you can hear me yeah. um and this is the both of you have you separated conscious networking um from subconscious networking and are you actively engaged in both now that you've kind of found some kind of uh, footing in, in your kind of creative careers? And um, once you've answered that, I'll come back to you, Makeda, just to explain about a little bit about SDS. But I just wanted you to respond to that question. Me Have you me. separated conscious networking from subconscious and are you actively engaged in one or the other or both? I personally don't engage in um, any like purpose. Like I don't purposely network. I don't ever go out like to network or go to something to network. I am though. I am now conscious because of these these results that I've had. Um, I am I'm, I'm aware when I'm chatting to someone new that it could you know who knows we could maybe work together. But um, no, I'm quite. I don't know if this sounds a bit. 
Yeah, but he's, <laughs> it's like the vibe is right. You know, if we get along, if um, if things are meant to be, I don't believe in coincidences, and it kind of does end up happening in the end if it's meant to. I think. Mm. But so yeah, I'm conscious of it, but I'm not doing it intentionally, and I'm never actually trying to network. But I do, and now I'm aware of the possible results that you can get from it. Do you feel lucky? <laughs> Basically, yeah. <laughs> it's about valuing relationships and knowing that they can, um, you can get more from them. You know. Okay. Let, let me just put it to Makeda now. Then, do you consciously or subconsciously or neither when it comes to networking? I think I've done a bit of both. I think from coming out of university, it was kind of like drilled into us, like go network, go network. So what a lot of us would do was purposely go out to network, even though we had no understanding as to how to do that, <laughs> I would say. But we would we would try to do it, just, you know, go to places and meet a couple of people. But I think for me, like with the career I've had so far, it has been kind of, um, it hasn't been forceful. I think it has kind of been you gravitate towards certain people and certain people that will then gravitate towards you. And I kind of do do agree. It's kind of like a vibe as well that you can kind of get from certain people. And I think in certain events or situations that you're put in, people with similar vibes do just genuinely kind of go towards each other. And within that wonderful networks and connections, I think can then be made. <laughs> okay, as, as the elder here. <laughs> Um, let me put this to you, that in order for that vibe to happen, both entities have to be in that vicinity, in that space at the same time. Networking is as much about targeting that space as being in that space. And if you're not targeting that space, there's every possibility that it takes you longer to arrive in that space, if at all. Mm. Would, would, you, would you accept? Or? Yeah. You I can make that decision as to yeah. whether it's happening naturally, if there's a vibe, once you're both in that space. Mm. But in terms of business and why networking is taken so seriously and why the phrase your network is your net worth is if you then looked at your network at any given moment in time, you'll find that putting it up quite harshly, some people are more useful to you and what you want to do at that moment in time than others. Mm. Yeah, and definitely. what you're trying to do is arrive at an imbalance, actually, where there are more people that are useful to you, let's put it that way, and what you want to do creatively than useless. Yeah. And so um, I don't want to persuade you. I just need you to, <laughs> <laughs> to arrive at your own conclusions. But yeah. I'm... Uh, even with Marley's kind of um, quite organic explanation of what's happening, for most creatives, it doesn't happen. Or if it does happen, it's just for a moment. And mm -hmm. they spend a lot of time trying to rekindle, recreate that moment. And so the whole idea of um, actively, consciously, strategically networking, which people refer to as a business activity, for a creative is now part of their routine activity. If not, it's at their peril. They're at mm -hmm. risk. And one of the reasons is, is because within the creative industries, you need to know more. And because you can't know everything at any given moment, you need more people around you that know those other things, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and they need to have the vibe, like you say, Marley, but they need to be in your vicinity and you need to be moving towards them as much as they're moving towards you. So anyway, I'll move on to Makeda with, um, tell us a bit about how did SDS come and just explain to us what that is, SDS come into being. Well, um, so SDS stands for setting the standards. Um, setting uh, the standards? Setting the standards. <laughs> I'll explain <laughs> why, with a D, I'll explain why it's a the and not a the. It was, it's kind of like a family, it's been a family phrase. From when I've been growing up, my older aunties and uncles and their friends would all be like, yeah, we're the SDS crew, we're always setting the standards. So, when I knew I wanted to do something with music, I said, oh my gosh, I really need a name. I said, I love the fact that SBS stands for setting the standards. That's exactly what I want to do with music. 
So I took it. <laughs> so, so I took the name. And that's basically then how the name SDS came in because we set the standards in, you know, what we do. Um, but yeah, I mean, at first for me, I thought I wanted to have like a record label. Um, but then I was kind of looking at my network, you could say, and saying, okay, what exactly is it that I could I could do off of the information that I know, but also the people around me? Um, so luckily from university, actually, this is where SDS started. Um, because while I live in Croydon, I knew that the music scene in Croydon is pretty bad, um, to put it bluntly. Uh, we don't really have a music, a music, like a live music scene doesn't really exist. You know, clubs and things have been shut down and it's just a bit hard to find people. Uh, so when I was at university, I was friends with somebody named Jade and she was also from Croydon and shared the same vision as me. So we would often talk about Croydon and have the conversations and I brought up the idea of how about we have an entertainment company called SDS Entertainment that puts up that puts on live events and opportunities for young people and things like that. And she was like, yes, let's do it. So I had my business partner right there. We then had our first event. We managed to get our first event actually, all because of Form 696. So before I kind of go into detail about you know how SDS formed in terms of the team, I'll say the reason why SDS was able to get to the stage that it's at now was because of the network I had around the work I did on Form 696 and Twitter. So it was literally just because um, somebody saw an article about Form 696 and I think my name was in it and they tweeted about it on Twitter. And then luckily a Croydon counselor saw it and he DM'd me and said, we should talk. And I said, sure. <laughs> I was like, sure, we should go, let's go for a coffee, let's talk. So I didn't really know what to expect, but you know, I explained it to him. He said, what is it that you want? I said, I want to have my own building. I want to have this. But what I really want to do is just start an open mic night, but I need the money. He said, what, I, what about if I give you the money? I said, well, if you give me the money, I can, I can make it happen. So that's what happened. <laughs> for the first few shows that we did, uh, the councillor gave us um, a, a grant and we were able to pay for the venue, pay for some equipment, and then just get a bunch of artists in the door and then just at least try and start uh, a hub movement is what we're calling it in Croydon. Um, so at that point, the money was then taken care of. It was then, okay, the team. And so for me to get the team, I knew that I needed creative people. I knew that I needed um, I needed a host for the live events. I knew that I needed a photographer. Um, I knew that I needed uh, somebody to do graphics for the logo for SDS. Um, and then just like some other people to deal with other areas within the team. So luckily, my friends were all creatives. So when we had our first event, I asked um, one friend who I was like, she has a, the great personality to be a host. She was like, oh, I'll, I'll be the host. I said, okay, tick, the host is done. My other friend, he um, did photography at, at university. I said, would you like to take photos for SDS? He said, sure. I was like, photographer, tick. Um, and then we had um, graphics as well. I knew a friend that did graphics said, I need a logo. And I drew something that was really bad. And I said, can you make something from this? He said, sure. Can, no I, can I just interrupt for a second and ask, <laughs> didn't anyone at any point say, yeah, we want to help Makeda, but yo, you got to pay me, man? Not a single person said they needed to pay me because they all understood the vision of what um, SCS was about and what we're trying to do in Croydon. And everybody was also from Croydon. So we all knew that, you know, we like music, but if we wanted to go and see some, somebody perform live in Croydon, there was literally nowhere for you to go. There was... There wasn't a venue, a located venue for like say an open mic night or anything like that. So we all knew that we wanted to create some kind of buzz, like a nightlife in Croydon. If we could produce that, everybody was just like, yeah, sure. I did ask. I did say, are you sure? I said, I can't pay you. I said, I can't give you, I can maybe give you a drink every now and then when we have a, a show. <laughs> but they said, no, we believe, in, we believe in the idea. And that same team is still with me um, three years down the line. Um, and, you know, based off of that, we've managed to uh, apply for funding from Arts Council um, and, you know, put on, produce their website, uh, put on various different shows. Um, we even put on a, our first mini community festival. Um, I can show you a video of that in a second as well. But for me, that my SDS network was really just my friends around me who, you know, were creatives. And I think at that point, we're all kind of graduating from university and they also need like a leg up. So for me, it was a thing of, I've got the opportunity. I've got the network of people 
um, around me because of Form 696? Can I produce and offer a platform to not only help the young creators, but also my team? And um, yeah, I think we've, we've done pretty well since that initial first showcase. Um, but yeah, the network, the network, the network was, the network was not hard to hard to do, but it was a thing of having to then pick. I had a few creative friends, but it was to pick the right creative friends to ask to do certain jobs and things like that. So for example, like I need to know, I need a really um, high quality profile um, logo. Which friend can I go to that I know will definitely give me the right logo and you know give me all the right files and things like that that I needed. And that's kind of then how the SDS model came about. So when we did the festival, it was the same concept within the team who can create the logo, who can create the, the festival map. You know, we had to then expand the team at that point, try and find a videographer because this was but, during. But here's the question, corona. sorry to interrupt, but are you paying anyone then? <laughs> <laughs> no. So, so the only uh, time that uh, we did pay was when we received funding, but even then no, nobody was getting a salary and SDS is still part-time, even though it seems full-time. <laughs> well, so let me put it to this, this way then. You're obviously very good at networking, very good at, as I said, selling the idea and getting people to buy in to your future, mm -hmm. which is a big part of networking. People buy into what you, t almost predicting will happen in the yeah. future and a big part of networking in the moment is about selling the future it's marketing the future to someone in a way that they feel they want to be part of that future hmm. so you're obviously pretty successful at that because you've gone from one person to putting together a whole collection of individuals who buy into the idea of sds yeah. would that yeah. be fair to say yeah i think yeah that would definitely be, be fair to say i think the, they definitely believe in what it is that I'll say it like this, that I'm selling to them um, <laughs> in a weird way to say it. They definitely believe it. But I think from then actually physically being a part of the process and then, mm. you know, through the network of, you know, having conversations with certain people and inviting members of the team into those conversations so that my network is then their network. I think that's then an extension of, you know, them, them saying yeah we'll continue to do this for free because we know that you know it may not be money that we're getting but like you said the network that we're getting can then become our net worth in that sense in the long run so, so cutting to the chase are you more valuable to the creative industries as a what as a result of your network i would say yes um i would say i am valuable because i feel like i have from let's say form 696 and then even from the work i'm doing in croydon I feel like I'm able to see the results that we see maybe on the bottom level to get them up to a level for people to actually make change and to actually implement, um, you know, like different changes that need to happen or for certain conversations to happen that, you know, if certain people don't speak a certain way to, to the people in the middle who are then going to invite you to meet to the people at the top, I think I'm pretty good at being able to speak to one, two and three. And um, if I put the same question to you, um, uh, Marley, would you say that you are more valuable to the creative industries as a result of your network? Or would you weight it more on your creative output? I actually think it's both. Do I have to pick? Do I have to pick? <laughs> <laughs> and I'll explain why. And I also, just as you were asking that question to Makeda, um, I was, I realised something and I was also thinking that uh, I suppose my response is yes. Firstly, to that question, I am, I think, more valuable because of my network. Um, but that's because, and I think it's, and I, this goes on to what I was going to say next, it's because of a network that I kind of inherited, that I was born into. Um, so for instance, like someone has contacted me today and they want to, and often when I when I do panels or things, it's I think it's to do with the fact that I have a father in the music industry and uh, he's still active in the music industry. So people, like, it's a great way to bridge the gap between generations and talk about things like that. And I think that seems, to me, I feel like people value that um, before they even have listened to my music, they value that. So I think, yeah, my network is probably the most valuable thing um, about me to the creative industry and scenes. 
And I also realized coming back to like before uh, when you asked me about um, about networking like intentionally basically, and I realized also maybe why I don't, and that's because I because I was kind of born into this music network, um, and I didn't think you had to do that. Mm. So I, I, but at the same time, I also completely see how you do and you saying that it takes so much longer when you don't and that's the reason why there's this huge gap in between when i started making music when i first released music and now the success it's only actually in the last couple of years that i'm i'm seeing real um progress month by month year by year and that's actually because i'm doing things with intention and i'm not networking intentionally people on my team are i have an agent i have managers um, i was coming to that <laughs> So, yes. So, you preempted my next question. Um, so, in terms of advice, this is perhaps our third and perhaps last section. Advice, having achieved something, and you know, let's not get into too much into what you've achieved, but having recognised you've achieved something, and the industry has responded by supporting that achievement, and it, it can be monetary, it can be just... Uh, professionals saying okay we'll support what you're doing um, mm -hmm. we'll rubber stamp it how would you advise someone coming into the industry now I mean I'll say my two pennies worth at the end but how would you advise someone coming in I'll just stay with you Marley for the moment um, in regards to networking yeah and its value in terms of even sustaining a career let's put it that way I would say, yeah, I would definitely say to them, despite what I what I do or what I did um, or what I think that, well, no, not what I think. Um, I do think that it is valuable to them. I think they should be mindful and conscious of the relationships. Maybe I wouldn't frame it as networking, but the relationships that they make, um, building rapport with other people who are in spaces that they wish to see themselves in or doing things that they would like to do. Um, and also from experience um, and a bad experience with it, as in I didn't do it very well. I think communication, I think staying in contact with these people, nurturing these relationships um, and responding in a timely manner. <laughs> I would definitely, yeah. So I'd say to them, I mean, it's cool if you only want to work with people you actually get along with. I mean, you're not going to be able, you can't communicate with someone who, you know, if, if you are bumping heads or you can't communicate well together, um, then it, you can't force it, I don't think. But to definitely uh, be a bit more intentional about things and about where you want to see yourself and where you want to see your work and, yeah, what you want to do and kind of going after that um, with the relationships, yeah, that you nurture in mind. Okay. A question that I actually just had was, do you think then that um, if you approach things differently when you, when you were younger, that your network right now would be completely different? Or do you think that it would just kind of, would have kind of met in the middle in some way? It would be completely different. Um, yeah, I think I would have, I would be, I'd probably, well, I'm just sorry. I just jumped straight to monetary, but I wanted to say like I'd probably be sitting in a flat that is my own and not a flat share. Um, I think I would have made a lot more money and been a lot more established and, yeah, been a lot further in, in my career if I had been more ambitious, basically. Been ambitious. I wasn't ambitious in the beginning. This last bit, I think, is really important because it's, it's, it's communicating the passing message, right? And what's really interesting about this chat is it seems as though it's something you can just leave out of the equation and it will happen. We will somehow find our way, life, the stars will align and it will happen. And for some of us, that is true. Mm. It's absolutely true. And that's what screws it all up, actually, <laughs> because it's, it's just a few of us. And it happens just for a moment. And uh, certainly in, in my history, my time in the music industry, what I realise is that at some point for all of us, it happens. But that moment lasts for different lengths of time. 
Um, and in most cases, it's a very short moment. And we spend a lot of our creative energy then chasing that moment when it's seemed to all come together and, and work in a way that we wanted it to. And we'll spend a lot of time looking at other successful people that have managed to hold it together. And one of, um, when I say hold it together, it means they've got some success built on it and built on it and built on it again. And one of the interesting things um, I think Marley mentioned was about management. Now I've got management and I've got an agent and blah, blah, blah. I started out by saying that one of the things we need to recognize is we can't do everything. Mm. And as the instant you accept that as a creative, you also should be looking at what do you do best? Mm. What is it about your creativity that um, uh, has the real spark energy that you can market to someone and they buy into quite quickly? In fact, they've bought into it before you've opened your mouth. They've recognized it. Mm. What is that? And it's not everything that you do. It will be something that you do. Yeah. Or a few things that you do as an individual in a particular way. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you recognize what that is, um, you're more powerful, you're more independent. And you drop the other things that you're trying to do. And you, I shouldn't say drop, but you defer them to other more capable individuals. And a big challenge for the creative in terms of networking is first recognizing what is it you do well, what's your creative spark, mm. um, so you can market it, you can talk about it, you can sell it to others. Also that other people don't tell you what it is and um, mislead you. But at the same time, you then identify the same creative spark in others. What is it that others do really well? that is beneficial to you. Yeah. And it sounds very calculated uh, because it is. Yeah. It, it really is. And creatives naturally gravitate to this creative spark in others. They network towards that spark, that light, wherever they see it, mm. but they have to be in a position to see it. And that means you're not looking at yourself. You're looking at others. Mm. And also when you get really good at it, your light, your creative bulb, whatever it is, shines brighter. And other creatives in that space are more able to see you. But strategically, and this is the crucial bit, certainly what I found is that maintaining that focus requires a certain amount of energy as well. Mm. Um, and some creatives spend so much time in brackets being creative that they're not actually focusing on developing their creative community, their creative mm -hmm. network. Um, in fact, they're fighting with their creative network. Um, they surrounded themselves with individuals that simply have gravitated to the light like moths. And then <clears throat> they find that they can't move forward. So strategic networking is clarity actually as to who you are, what you're doing in the moment, because the moment changes, and identifying those that can best assist your creativity. And guess what? You don't have to like them. Yeah. It helps. Mm -hmm. It does help. Mm -hmm. But with my business hat on, this is my business hat, um, you don't have to like them. They just need to be professional in terms of their approach to the industry and with that in mind i'm just going to share one last slide i think for the time um and it's my um linkedin um page if i can get this up i'm just going to go through this very quickly with you um and the reason i'm sharing my linkedin page is because linkedin is perhaps the largest professional networking uh platform uh out there and it's certainly one of the most successful. And on it, um, you develop a community. And here you'll see that my com community is 3,888, it's just under 4,000. It's not about numbers on this platform. A lot of people think it's about, you know, like, oh God, my Insta, I got X thousands of people, my Facebook, my Twitter, my TikTok, 
on this platform, it isn't about numbers. It's about individuals that are useful to what you want to do. And on this platform, um, I, without going into loads of people's uh, faces, what I did was I decided every three months how I want my profile to change. So if you looked at this three months ago, it wouldn't have said um, director, whatever. It would have said curator because my current project is I decided I'm gonna be a curator and I needed to attract uh, skill sets around uh, curators actually. And so um, in this bit where it says experience, I reordered my experiences and I put at the top um, the Museum of London. Um, and the reason for that is uh, I'm uh, on the academic panel for the Museum of London. And I wanted to attract that type of expertise to feed into my next project. And it's, a comp it's not complicated, it's about clarity. So in that, moment where I decide that okay my next major project is that I'm, I'm gonna I want to be a curator I want to put on major exhibitions I change my outward looking profile and on this platform it's about business it's about jobs it's about getting paid and so your network on this platform people look at who's looking at you and they value you they look at your history your provenance what you've done and who's looking at you. And so you, you're advised to strategically target your next job is a, is a way of putting it. Now, as a creative, that means, well, you know what your next job is. Right. And normally you're more inclined to work on that next job on your own. I'll just get off this for a moment. Um, I'm going through some of the jobs I've done in the last kind of 12 months. This job is, um, this is, Brent was Borough of Culture. And so it was looking at that history, which is black music in Brent, um, vintage musicians, how they contributed, um, who they were, finding them, setting up an archive, putting, up, um, putting together an exhibition. But it's a job for the council. This is working with the council. And as simple as it seems, coming out of Form 696, which is kind of government and politics, meant an inroad to working with the council. And if you look at the individuals, it's a range of individuals, hmm. range of ages, whether it's a garage MC or, um, <clears throat> or a singer from the 70s in reggae, um, these projects and these individuals are completely varied. Um, I set up a mixed cloud uh, site, site and created a podcast. As strange as this might seem, this podcast as a project was specifically set up to target getting a sponsored podcast and to have people who look at podcasts um, get in touch. And as a result of this, um, today I've got uh, an email from BBC Podcasting, and they're looking at um, whether I'd contribute to a podcast they're making, right? So each, I'm quite strategic about it, is my point. Mm -hmm. This is our YouTube channel. Again, quite deliberately um, marketing uh, previous projects and um, future projects. And these various platforms are there. I'll just get off this for the moment. These various platforms are about networking. It's not about socials. It's not about building friends. It's creatively saying, I've done this. There it is. Um, this is what I'm going to be doing next. And there are links to all these platforms. They're interlinked, which means that creatively, I'm busy, but networking, as far as networking is concerned, you have a lot to look at and there's a lot of professionals involved. And I'm not saying I've done everything. I've not. In, on each platform, there is a different person that is principal to that platform 
that allows me to work in other areas. So lastly, um, I'm just going to come back to each of you and I'll start with Makeda. Is there anything else that you'd want to add in terms of how you think uh, moving into the future projects you've benefited from, I'm going to use the word strategic targeted networking, as opposed um, to I'm in the space and the vibe happens. <laughs> um, yeah, I would, I would say, I think because of the strategic networking, because I would say I have been in very specific areas and I'll say for me, it's the, the money kind of area to SDS, which is funding. I've been very strategic in who to go to to receive the funding because I didn't realize, um, I think that towards the end of university, I didn't realize that funding was an option. So it wasn't until then, you know, and I spoke to the counselor and he told me about funding, then other funding opportunities happened, that I then said to myself, okay, I'm in a position where I know a lot of people who receive funding and, um, you know, who can probably then advise me as to how, how best to, to you know, receive grants and things like that for me to get SDS to where I needed to get to. Um, so for me, it is a thing of, still having the networks that I have um, to be able to continue at least for a couple of years to receive the funding um, to be able to um, to support the community the young community young black community especially of Croydon that I think need needs the support that isn't currently there and to be able to speak to my network and say do you know of any other funds that are available other grants or other opportunities so yeah okay that's what I'll that's say. Very clear, very concise. Uh, Marley? Mm. Mm. <laughs> um, you're gonna have to repeat it for me, I'm sorry, Michael. Well, I was just saying as it's a, it's a so I can be concise, or it's not, I'm just gonna walk it's, it's, it's a difference, no, no, because sometimes it's, if you don't work in this way, it's, 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 I was gonna, almost swore then it's a head f um <laughs> but it's um about being targeted and strategic in networking um and just as a, as a passing thought whether you're now conscious of that and the benefits of that going forward i am in a way i was thinking about that and thinking again i still don't kind of consciously network or go and meet new people. But I think a way that I do is with um, social networking. I'm very conscious about who I follow and who I interact with online. And um, to be honest with you, it's very little effort, but it does give, I, I put very little out. I might just comment on someone's page or something and then it, it opens up conversation. Next thing I know that we're DMing about a project or an opportunity. So I'm, yeah, I'm very conscious with it, um, with my online presence and with who I choose to engage with online uh, and in which ways. Um, that's, but just, yeah. just, just yeah. to hold that thought, that's really strategic. We actually have a whole module on that, you believe it or not, yeah. which is what you look at, what you spend time on, because there's an algorithm also watching what you do online. Um, and in some instances, um, one of the classes looks at um, things that you should retweet or repost mm. and things that you shouldn't um, in order to prove your, improve your standing online and who might be looking at you. Yeah. And strategically, you, you say it very casually because it's very natural, but that comes on a strategic actual networking. What you repost. Is, says as much about you as it does about the content of the post. Yeah, there's so, a confidence level in there as well, I'd say. Yeah. And in terms of making, you know, I just want to add a, a last comment. I think we're coming up against the clock. Um, it is possible to create a, a persona where in terms of funding, the funding spaces feel comfortable to fund you based on the profile you've developed and the network that you've developed. And to validate funding you, they check out your network, mm -hmm. is the point. Um, yeah. 
I'm going to share one screen very briefly just to prove the point because I'm broke, but it just shows you it is possible. Um, this is what I received about four years ago, or I should put it more clearly, what the re university received on the project that I developed. To get to that level of funding, I was going to say you have to kiss a lot of frogs to find a prince, but that's, <laughs> I'm a bloke, it's the wrong metaphor, but you get what I'm saying. I had to network through a lot of levels, a lot of tiers um, to convince um, the funders that I might not um, run off with the money, not that they gave it to me, but that I was suitably um, qualified to do that. And I qualify not through um, simply my work, but through who was networked into my work. And so that way I increased my net worth through the people involved. And that's, that's the point where we started out. Your network is your net worth. Um, that's my passing, last passing comment. Have you got a closing comment, Makeda? Uh, Marley? Closing comment. Um, or I do think you my... want to show a video or anything? I don't know. I think, well, I, I'll, I'll actually, I'll show, I'll show a video as my um, kind of closing, closing comment. And it's just like you're saying, your network is your network and just being able to communicate with numerous different people to facilitate an idea that you just have in, inside your head. Um, and so that for me, it was, I knew that I always wanted to, to do a festival. Um, and it was just to, to speak to the right people to be able to say, okay, who can help to, even if it's a small festival, who can help to, um, to produce the festival and to facilitate it. So I think what I'll just do is just show a very short uh, video of that. Okay. I don't come for the letter, missing the word that they do with that. End this shit, man, we love that. NCT's gone too fast. Really in the kitchen, are you really preaching wisdom? Are you part of the system, preacher? Why your chain glisten? Are your congregation? Fox that come like Marshall, uh. Takashi, no castle, uh. Avenge my life, like Marvel, uh. Yeah. The bigger it gets, the more I know it's all these hoes. I trust you, I don't trust that. Scary dreams, I. So that was just a very quick video just to show like for the festival we had four different stages and for us it was how do we get enough artists on the four different stages who can we talk to and it was just through us being able to be strategic in terms of going on our social media and you know looking through our list of people and saying who can help be curators of certain stages who can help us to get a couple of profiled artists and things like that so my closing word is just for me to be able to, to have done the BOP live, I had to go and be strategic. So be, strate be strategic in the big projects that you have because it will benefit you in the long run. Thank you. Um, Marley, you don't have to have a closing comment, but... No, I think I've said everything before. I think I would like to, uh, because I feel like I've my opinion or my answers have kind of been like a yes and then a no and a... <laughs> I think I would like to, to say my my final stance on networking in like reflecting uh I now think it definitely is very valuable and it should be done um uh, intentionally and it's great when it happens unconsciously but it really you can you can save a lot of time <laughs> So yeah, I definitely see the value in it. <laughs> but, yeah, but like actually, yeah, go out there. You, you know what's funny about the way you put things? Yeah. You think that you're convoluted and unclear, mm. but actually um, it's just a different way of communicating. Mm. And you, it came across very clearly actually that there is no one way to doing this um, and that in the process of doing this, we go through our own route, if you like, and it's not a straight pathway at all. Mm -hmm. um, and that came across quite clearly that you understand the, the benefits, if you like, of it. Yeah, definitely. Um, but the bobbing and weaving and the nonsense of it as well. <laughs>
yeah. yeah. And if if we can get it to, I'm not speaking for you. I'm just interpreting. Um, mm -hmm. uh, if we can get it to happen naturally, that's a good thing. Mm 